it's May 5th, 2021. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order by acknowledging it's a vir another virtual meeting, and we all are going to do that uh, under the auspices of the governor's executive order. Uh, and I encourage the public, if you are watching, if you have any questions, please email us and we will get back to you uh, in a timely manner. Uh, and as a way to call to order, we will have a roll call. And something tells me that's Bridget. Will you be doing that? That is me. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Council Member Atlas Engebretson. Atlas Engebretson. Barber. Here. Sandra. Here. Cummings? Here. Ferguson? Here. Fredson? Here. Gonzalez? Here. Johnson? Here. Lee? Lee? Lilligren? Here. Muse? Here. Sterner. Sterner. Vento. Here. Sterner's here. Sorry, Sterner's here. Okay. Uh, Wolf. Here. Varen. Present. Chair Zelly. I'm here. I think we have a quorum. And now uh, we have a very simple agenda. And if there is no questions uh, or uh, any disagreement with the agenda, I will assume it is approved. Which brings us to the minutes from the meeting on April 21st, the regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole, uh, which I sent out in advance. Is there a motion for the approval of the minutes? Thank you, Councilman Vento and Chambliss. Uh, any comments, discussion, corrections? All right, hearing none, Bridget, you may call the roll. All right, Councilmember Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Barber? Aye. Sandler? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Lee? Lilligren? Aye. Muse? Aye. Sterner? Sterner? Aye. Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zarin? Aye. Chair Zelly? Aye. Well, those minutes uh, are approved. Which brings us to our one uh, information item for this committee to hold. Um, and this uh, uh, has uh, been something that I think we've been talking about uh, uh, for some time. Just also note in the chat that uh, Council Member uh, Atlas Ingebrigtsen is here. Um, uh, so we're gonna be taking a look at the long-term financial outlook for transit. Um, and uh, this is something I think uh, some of us are familiar with, certainly the Transportation Committee. Uh, but we have been talking about, uh, in particular, this past legislative session, issues associated with the, the, both the operations and the long-term life cycle capital needs of, of guideways. And as we look at building more guideways, uh, that is part of the transit puzzle, but also we've been uh, talking about advancing arterial bus rapid transit, very important 
part of our vision. We also have regular boss. We have conversations about North Star. And then every, it seems like in every segment, we talk about uh, the puzzle of funding. So it comes from local government, comes from uh, the state government, comes from various streams of state financing and federal financing. And it uh, really kind of came to bear that because of the complex nature of it and where we're heading, over the next few years and decades, um, it would really be helpful for all of us to kind of get on a level playing field of, of, of uh, knowledge and understanding. So really almost looking back, not just from a Met Council point of view, but just this regional transit system as a whole, how, how does it work? How is it financed? What are the issues going forward? This isn't for action, this is purely for awareness. And there's issues that have come up just recently, which have been in the news. Uh, some of it has been misunderstood. And uh, I know that there's great expertise in this room from some of us, but not, not totally shared. So uh, this is a great opportunity for us to kind of dig a little bit deeper, not too deep, but enough as a general knowledge overview and uh, to ask questions and really kind of hear, hear from staff. Uh, so I'm really thrilled that we have uh, Nick Thompson, who I think is going to lead us off, and we certainly going to hear from the uh, finance side, Ed Petrie, and our um, our uh, bus uh, uh, arterial busway and busway expert uh, Charles Carlson, and I know West Coyster is with us too to answer questions. So with that, I think we're probably going to get a little information download with a PowerPoint. Hopefully not. Uh, 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 too much, we can stop along the way and uh, kind of answer questions or people have comments. Uh, uh, but uh, really to kick us off, I think it's gonna be Nick Thompson. Nick, are you starting? Yep, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. Um, happy to talk to you tonight and show you all the pieces of that puzzle that the chair mentioned. Um, maybe a little bit of tonight, we'll do a little bit of uh, starting to solve the puzzle. Um, so, but we want to start before we get into the financial outlook, both both on the operating side and the capital side. Tonight we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a few different time frames. A lot of it is in the next 10 years, this decade, which is an important decade for building out our transit system. We have, we'll also touch on even the longer term in terms of our how we see the capital maintenance issues playing out that you, many of you have been aware of this uh, during this session and working with the counties. And then a little bit about some short-term issues on, on funding that we wanna make you aware of tonight. So if you could go to the next slide, right? But before I, we get into the details of funding, I think it's important to talk about that vision that we have for the region. We, and when I say we, it is not just the council, it is our region's vision and our local partners and our communities that are have built this vision for our generation or this transit network. I mean, if, if you think about in transportation planning, the highway network was built, a lot of it was built in the 60s and 70s and has matured. It's the transit network now that we are in the middle of building as we, uh, fit it into what is needed for our region. Um, and we are not even halfway there on our, our large metro network. If you see on this page, it's we're going to be building, opening, building, beginning to operate 11 new metro lines in the next decade. Um, we've, we have six in operation today, so we're not even halfway there to that vision. Later this year, we're opening the orange line. Uh, we had received good news on the goal line recently as we move into a new phase. Southwest LRT uh, well underway towards a, a opening in the next couple of years. And so a lot of work going here. And of course, the arterial BRT network, which you just approved as a council of the next vision component of the vision for the FG and H line, which um, we begin to work on now that they've been approved. And all that underlying all of that is assumption that we will build our bus network to support that vision. So we, we're planning on a, an increase of 1% of our bus service, our regular bus service 
A lot of that is adding to connect to these new transit ways. Next slide, Greg. And what does that vision look like? This is that vision for our region. That by the end of by 2030, all of this we anticipate, we hope, will be built in an operation with the exception of the Riverview, which would be one that will be under construction and, and close to being open by the end of this decade. This is a vision that connects our entire region. We are, in this decade, we're in the phase of connecting out to the suburban communities are the ones that are starting to get the all day reliable connected service that we all know that once we have the network in place, it really, it feeds on itself in building connections and choices and to jobs and events and where people wanna go across that whole system. So this is the vision we're gonna talk about from a financial standpoint tonight. Um, what are some of where we're going financially, where our gaps are, where some of our challenges are to realize this vision. Next slide, please. So I will start with some kind of deep background on our operations and capital uh, before, and then there's opportunity to pause and get into the detail there before I turn it over to Charles, where he talks about the guideways and, and and some of the work that you as a council, some of the decision processes that where you fit in in this process of helping approve and build this network. Next slide, please. So like uh, I think the chair has mentioned, it is a puzzle that is very complicated that we're trying at the highest level to present a simple message about, about this system. We have a vision, our region has a vision that we want to build. The vision is built in with different funding uh, opportunities and operated through different funding ways based on the type of system. And we'll talk today mostly about rail and bus, but Metro Mobility, one of our large and rapidly growing uh, systems is also one we wanted to highlight on this slide. What, what you want to point out here is that that top bar, this is, this is a snapshot based on 2020. Top bar is our entire transit system. Um, how is it funded? And you see the different major components of that. Uh, the users of the system are big contributors. Um, almost 20% of the operations in the system is funded by the users. The federal plays a very small role in, in the system. Their more, federal sources are more on the capital investment and, and building the network. It is the local and state fair uh, sources that are really key to funding the operations. And the state has two main sources. It's our general fund appropriation that we receive for the council. We have that $89 million base for transit operations. Um, but we also have the, the, the workhorse of our operations, which is the motor vehicle sales tax, which we is a state statewide tax. And lastly, the counties, they play a role in the operations of the guideway system. But overall, the counties are funding about roughly 5% of the operations of our, our transit system in the region. And below that, you see the different breakdown where the county's role is in the rail and the guideway system. Um, it's the local bus that is funded mostly by MBUS and fares. And then Metro Mobility has two sources. It's the general fund and fare structure from the county. So different mix here, um, but I think it's important to focus a little bit on that system-wide. How are we funding the system? Because our transit system works when you think about it as a system. Next slide, please. So each of those sources uh, have some risks with them and we have some drivers. Our operating need is growing. Um, it's growing because of, we're building out a system, we're expanding our system. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, Metro Mobility. Metro Mobility historically has been growing at nearly 6% or more per year. And that's a service that we grow that system to meet the demand. We are required and we are happy to meet the demand, but we must meet the demand of the system. And it's just the way that demographically, population wise, that system is gonna to continue to grow at a very fast pace for a, while, for a while. We are hoping this session that maybe the, the legislature will look at that and say we are, uh, and make some changes to how that is funded. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but it, there's some promise that there that the legislature will 
say that that program should be funded through a forecaster program, which would fill in one of their major long-term gaps in funding potential. And every time we're adding to this metro network, we're increasing the need for um, our operations, both from our, sometimes from our county partners, and then also from the state as we build up this network. Each of our operating funding sources come with some risks that when you're trying to build a long-term vision for the region, you gotta be aware of that risk. Uh, annually, and we'll hear later about it today, um, is that there's county commitments, uh, that, there, that there's some risk of, that, of those commitments uh, not being there on an annual basis. basis. We are building out an arterial BRT network that when we started this system with the eight line, we did receive a, a, some increase for our general fund for the increase for the A line, but um, we have an expectation of needing more uh, state assistance as we build our arterial BRT network. And increasing, as you're fully aware, increasing the state commitment to the system is, is always a risk that we must play every year uh, that the legislature meets, we, we are working with them to realize that commitment. We are in a cycle of one-time funding appropriations that makes it very hard to plan for our operations. They, prior to COVID, we had a one, we had several op options where, or several times where we received one-time appropriations uh, for a two-year biennium that did not increase our base, but in the short term solved a, a funding gap that we had in operations. And this past year, we've received three one-time federal relief appropriations related to the impacts of COVID, which have been critical to continuing our operations. And we'll talk a little bit about how important that has been, not just for last year and this year, but for the next couple of years also. Our motor vehicle sales tax, which is, uh, as it is so important to our bus operations, is a volatile source of funding that is uh, based on people's ability to buy vehicles. Uh, 2008, for example, we had a tremendous drop in the motor vehicle sales tax with the recession. Last year, early on in COVID, um, huge decreases in the, uh, revenue from motor vehicle sales tax. We did see that recover, uh, fortunately, uh, by the end of 2020, but it just pointed to how risky that, that source is. And even this year, with the economy beginning to rebound, um, there's a new risk with motor vehicle sales tax, and that you may have heard in you know, the car manufacturers are having to delay manufacture of vehicles because of lack of chips to go in, computer chips to go into the vehicles. And if there aren't vehicles for the public to buy, there's a risk through the motor vehicle sales tax at least in the short term. So it just points to the volatility of that funding source. And then fair revenue. Fair revenues had been fairly predictable, uh, but this past year we saw a tremendous erosion as our ridership has dropped. As you recall, for several months, we for safety protocols, we were not collecting fares until we were able to uh, make modifications to our transit system to protect both the public and the drivers. Um, so fair revenue is below what we had normally, but that's a, a key component of our operations. And really, we've talked to you uh, several times about structural deficits. Um, we've been able with the federal, with these one-time sources, being able to push that off into the future. As we'll talk about, starting in 2026, we have significant annual ongoing uh, operation deficits. Next slide, please. Just to highlight the importance of those one-time funding, just some of those. Uh, two years ago, we received a one-time biennium appropriation from the legislature to fill a need we had for Metro Mobility. Uh, that one-time fund goes through June of this year. Um, it was very important, but it, it, you know that Metro Mobility doesn't decrease in ridership after June that need just resumes after in the next biennium. And you see the three federal uh, allocations for related to COVID relief, the latest one being the American Re Recovery Plan. Um, we're still waiting on details of the last one. We, uh, we uh, 
submitted and we're starting to receive funding on the first two federal ones. And, and we have a plan for using those for operations and in a little bit we'll talk about about how we we'll help with our capital needs too. And we've had to uh, use our program reserves for our various funds, which are that reserves are important to build, but they are considered one time funding sources that you uh, are available at one time. And we've been able to do 26 um, through 2025 nearly meet our, our needs, but if by 25, 26, our expenses are going to exceed our revenues by nearly 200 million. Next slide, please. So looking at our state needs for general funds above our $89 million base, the source of this graph comes from a, a transit finance report that was submitted to the legislature in February, plus uh, federal funding, the last round of federal funding that we received. We do not have a deficit for until we're not projecting a deficit under current law, knowing that the legislature is not done yet and that could change in the next couple of weeks. But under current law, we're forecasting that we, with thanks to the one time funding sources and um, our growth and how we've managed our operations, it's just that in 2025, we have a small um, need for a small deficit. That's probably manageable at the scale at that scale, but in 2026, all that one-time funding funding is used up, and we continue to grow our operating needs. We're starting to bring on our new expansion projects by then that have new operating needs, um, and so you see that on an annual basis we go from 168 million dollar need for additional state revenue. Um, to nearly $200 million above that $89 million base by 2030. Um, and this assumes, and when I mentioned state law, this assumes that Metro Mobility has not become a forecasted program, so that is subject to change. But this is just the state need, and also the local needs will be growing. The local attributions to uh, our transit system will be growing over that time also. If you look at uh, this chart, what and the way to think about it is the blue bar is the need for our existing operations that we have today and it's growth. The orange bar and the gray bar are then new expansion of our service that is being built to serve that all day uh, reliable network across our system. Next slide, please. So that's the snapshot on operating. Uh, now we'll touch on capital funding. Uh, next slide, please. The capital uh, has a different has a different outlook because it has different funding sam, uh, inputs and different longer term uh, horizons that we need to consider. So, capital is where federal funds are are key to the building of our network, and they play a role in some of the capital maintenance. Very important role in our fleet replacement over time. Um, regional solicitation has been a key source. Regional solicitation are federal funds in our region, been a key source for our expansion uh, to, just to prove $25 million for the F line, for example, um, and, and both uh, A and D line, and C line and D line have all received funding from the regional solicitation. So very important for the um, arterial BRT network. Federally, the capital investment grants, new starts, small starts, as you're all aware, are, are 50 percent of the capital cost of our major transit waste and guideways. So, a critical source of building our network. And then there are occasional uh, federal grants that we are very successful in competing for. Um, we've received, for example, some for uh, electric vehicles. We received some for the Minneapolis bus garage in the past, as examples. And so, there's some competitive grants that are occur occasionally that are necessarily predictable, but are good sources of capital. In terms of our regional transit capital, the prop council's property tax that you approve each year are used to back our, our RTC bonds. Um, it is, uh, of course, a source that is at risk because it's at, we must first get the authority from the legislature. Um, we usually seek two years of authority for those bonds. We have had years where we have not received the authority. 
um, and had to wait a year in some of the capital purchases. So it is a, a one that is at risk. It's primarily bonds or capital that is used to match the federal uh, for bus purchases. Um, and it's also used for all the providers, including our suburban providers uh, and their fleet purchases. And what's important to remember, capital maintenance is a topic we, you've, we've talked a lot about in the spring. One we'll talk about tonight is that the nature of capital maintenance costs makes them not eligible for bonding, which creates one of the challenges for how do you fund the maintenance of capital is in most part because their, their lifespan is not long enough to meet the eligibility requirements of bonding. Next slide, please. So a snapshot of uh, when we when we look about our capital budget planning, uh, the council every year approves the CIP, a six year capital improvement program. Um, it must be balanced with the money that we have. And so it does not necessarily fund everything we need to fund. It funds everything, our highest priorities with the money that we have available. If you pull out the green line and blue line extensions, which are capital, but um, they're very large and kind of are a separate issue outside of that. So this is the rest of the capital that was approved in the last CIP that you approved the last uh, at the end of last year. And you kind of see the mix of funding of how what goes into the funding. Federal is uh, the dominant uh, or the majority of the funding, um, but then we also have our CMAC, which would be our regional solicitation funding. A very small portion of MVEST, which was in this case only because of our uh, of our federal one-time funding, or allowed what made us gave us the opportunity to shift some MVEST into capital this this time. Um, and then our local counties, they they're obviously a partner in our green and blue line, but in this CIP we also have a local share in the orange line and the gold line in the time horizon of this. So. The, uh, the local county slice of the pie uh, varies depending on where the guideways are in the development of the, the capital program. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we really want to talk about tonight is kind of the capital pressures that, that we see as we build out this network. Um, as I mentioned, the CIP is, spends all the money that we have available but we have needs well beyond that. In terms of prioritization of investments, maintaining the assets that we have is the priority of the CIP. Uh, maintaining them in a state of good repair so that we have a reliable system um, that our customers feel safe and comfortable using and gets them where they want to go on our system. Um, we have these ongoing rail capital pressures, um, capital maintenance related to track replacement and repair, signal and switch replacement. But we always, our technology, uh, life of our technology, as you all know, um, it needs to be replaced much sooner than a capital, some of the fixed capital costs. And then we're also, rail has a big, two, much, very long life on the rail cars, uh, but in order to get that long life, we'd have to, replacement and overhaul of major components that have cost. We um, talk that the 95 million that we were shifting because of the federal COVID relief has allowed us in the short term to deal with some of these rail unfunded in the short term, but in the long term, they still exist. In terms of bus, uh, we prioritize, of course, replacing our fleet on a cycle, uh, but we have some fairly large unfunded capital pressures in the bus that uh, a lot of discussion we've had over the past several years about electrification of the fleet, what we need to do in terms of uh, infrastructure and fleet financial needs to do that. Um, we have one major garage replacement that we anticipate is needed in the, this decade. Um, and we've historically had major grad replacements that are very difficult to fund within our capital program. And then we are at the, at the cusp and starting to uh, replace our entire fare collection system on this on network, 
across the entire system. And because of our capital pressures, um, we're having to do that at a very a pace that's slower than ideal, uh, but this some it's a very large cost on the system. So what's good to think about is in the rail, where we have a lot of pressure on things that are very important for state of good repair. Some of our bus pressures have some flexibility within them. When we electrify the fleet, how how long we have a garage and how we can maintain that existing garage before we replace one gives us some flexibility uh, in bus that we maybe don't have in rail for some of our fiscal pressures. Next slide, please. So we shifted, uh, so we brought in the federal funding of from the three federal COVID relief packages. Um, and we're still, the third one is one that is still not, is still in the works uh, from a federal standpoint that was passed more recently. So it takes time before we receive those funds. The um, looking at our operating needs over the next few years, which to be balanced, we were able to use $95 million of MVEST that would have went to operations and have the COVID relief you fill that gap on operations and move it to the critical needs that we had, that we saw deemed really were needed in the capital maintenance. And, and what prior to that shift of 95 million, you would have seen critical rail gaps in 2021 through 2025. And what uh, what that $95 million has allowed us to do is uh, meet those get capital funding for capital maintenance on a rail. And so we prioritize that for state of good repair. But immediately those after those funds rip, uh, run out, those one-time fund opportunities, you see the rail needs uh, for capital maintenance increase right away. And we continue to have an ongoing need for bus capital needs that is not currently projected to be funded in our capital improvement plans, nor do we have a good funding source to that we can anticipate for meeting those gaps in that kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So before we switch that over, I talked a lot in detail about operating capital funding and vision. I wanna pause here to see if there's questions before we transition to the guideway and some of the decision-making opportunities. Thank you, Nick. That is really a detailed overview. And uh, one thing I think you just were describing, these uh, federal one-time funds, the CARES funding and the others, are really there to shore up operations. In fact, they're restricted operations. So the fact that we were able to um, deploy it to operations and free up some operating reserves and that funds and in a sense um, it freed up funds to apply to the capital needs right. but but and and we're I mean it's all above board but it is it, there's a limit to what federal funds can be used for capital because they're actually restricted to operating if that makes sense that's correct sir. all right let's uh, any questions thoughts uh, Judy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one quick question. Nick, in this capital uh, investment plan that we have, is this uh, encompassing all the projects that we have or that are on the books or that are being drafted on our books? And then, um, I, so that's my first question. And secondly, if that's so, um, what about, you know, the future uh, plans that we haven't gotten, you know, um, off the books yet um, into plans? When do they start showing up or have you factored that into those, you know, longer range plans out for another decade? Mr. Council Member, that's a great question. We will touch on that a little bit uh, in terms of the long term. The CIP though is just the next six years and it's um, identifying all the needs. Um, we, we first go through and identify all the capital needs. But then we, as the council, you are only approving the ones that can be funded with the available funding. Uh, the good news on the new lines is that um, when we build a new guideway or transitway, in the first 
several years, there's very little capital maintenance needs. Um, it becomes an issue in the second decade or as your fleet starts to need to be replaced or, um, you know, we're, we're about to build, uh, like for example, the gold mine, we're building a road roadway, bridges um, and roadbeds and those, those have a long life. They have a 30 year life often before some major maintenance is needed. But we will have to plan with those, and we need to think about those as we're building building them. And I think that's part of what we want to talk about tonight. And we'll share, um, Charles will go into some detail about where some gaps are and where we think about those long-term funding. Um, and we'll have some high-level numbers about what we see as some of the long-term gaps. So I think we'll get a little more detail on your question in the future slides. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Nick. And that's the stuff, the the long term stuff that is around the corner, right? That so I'm glad to see that because I'm assuming we have those capital plans that go out past six years, and that's where the you know sleepless nights start to happen. So I really appreciate you going into this. Thank you, Reva. You have your hand up. Uh, yeah. So are you going to either of you going to go through how we plan to? meet these shortfalls in terms of partnerships or in terms of funding sources that we need to, you know, partners that we need to, or legislators that we need to get these things funded by. Uh, Mr. Chair, council members, I think that is part of the discussion tonight is like, we're identifying where some of the gaps are and some of the risks with the funding sources and then uh, I think we want to bring forward a discussion of where, what are our, what are some options we should, that should be explored. Uh, we aren't coming to you tonight with the solution to those options. Uh, unfortunately, it would be too easy. Um, but um, we wanted to lay that, kind of present that puzzle, and we have some clear gaps that do not have readily identifiable ways to fill those uh, under our current funding mechanism. And I would say no secret that the governor, this governor, the last governor, you know, had proposals for additional sales tax revenue for transit. Um, this uh, is not part of the administration's proposal this year because we, in a sense, have a couple of biennium breathing room under existing formulas and arrangements um, that were part of the plan. But as we look forward, what would that need be to support this system? And clearly, it's not any one source. It's probably uh, the collection of the, that. The, but it's good to kind of highlight what those options might be as we get into the conversation. Any other questions now? All right, we're going to hear about guideways. Is that Charles yep. or? Yeah. Char that was okay. Charles. Thanks. Great. Welcome, Charles. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as the slides come up, uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Charles Carlson, Director of Bus Rapid Transit Projects, uh, speaking today more broadly about guideways. So we have BRT lines that are arterial uh, BRT lines. We also have guideway BRT and other guideway projects. So in the next slide, we really specify what we mean by guideways. And guideways in this case is actually a state-defined um, service type Guideways are those transit ways that operate primarily or substantially within separate right of way or on rails. So they're, they're fixed guideway type operations. Uh, we have three of them in operation now, the Metro Blue Line and Green Line, as well as the North Star Commuter Rail. Uh, but we're looking to expand significantly and that expansion is underway with uh, Southwest LRT Green Line extension construction. Uh, as well as continued progress on uh, the other four lines shown here all of which we are intending to construct and, and uh, be ready to open for service or open nearly all of them uh, within the next 10 years. So a significant number of different lines representing billions of dollars of expansion investment uh, for the region. And this is, this is transformative, uh, transformative change in terms of mobility, in terms of access, in terms of uh, connecting folks to destinations in an attractive and convenient way. And so we're we're planning for these projects um, to deliver that you know really um, 
new transportation experience for the for the balance of the 21st century. And as we're working on those, of course, we run into various risks in developing them and executing them on time and on budget um, and getting the funding lined up, whether it's federal, state, or, or local funds. Uh, but we're also running into uh, the experience of owning and operating uh, lines that are in their second decade and beyond and we're seeing the capital maintenance that does crop up over that time frame, and so uh, that's that's one of the risks that we'll be, you know, we talked about the spring, but we'll be underscoring again uh, yet tonight. Next slide. And so as we bring that into the picture, it's important to think and kind of talk through how these projects come about and the uh, inputs and decisions that the council has along the way. Uh, this this slide kind of shows the overall implementation and, and planning processes. So these projects really begin with local planning. Uh, the for the guideway type projects, uh, in every case, the genesis of these projects have come from local plans and local sponsors. More often than not, a county or a, a, a partnership of counties executing local planning with local municipalities. Uh, identifying the locally preferred alternative. And what that means is the mode, so whether it's light rail or bus rapid transit or another mode, the alignment, so the streets and, and corridor uh, that, the, that the project will operate on, as well as the, the termini, so the start and end of the project. So those three decisions really create most of the decision framework and really chart most of the future for these projects future phases so uh, identifying approving and ultimately adopting the lpa is is the most critical decision in any of these projects and by and large the the planning for that takes place at the local level the council's decision point is when we are uh, positioning and preparing to adopt that locally preferred alternative into the region's fiscally constrained long range transportation plan, the 2040 TPP. And so that's that's the uh, probably the largest, but first council decision on many of these projects. Important to note that council is involved uh, throughout the planning of those processes. So both staff and policymakers engage with uh, local processes as they're as they're underway. Uh, but it's it's really when that when it comes to the council for that adoption that the council has its first major decision in that phase. From that point, the council typically takes over the project and will be uh, managing the project, including contracts and purchases, um, the regular business of staffing and, and developing these projects, entering them into the New Start's uh, federal pipeline and uh, solving some of the early design issues along the way. The major council policy decision that comes generally is in the form of approving a, an environmental decision uh, related to either the federal decision or for a state decision. Uh, so the council would have that policy role in, in approving the project at that point, uh, really bringing it into the next phase of the project, which is all about getting the project completely ready for construction and engineering. Approvals at this point generally relate to right of way to any contract amendments that are needed, as well as perhaps rolling stock purchases. So th that would all occur during this, what's called the engineering phase here. Uh, that phase really concludes as the project is getting ready to move into full construction. Uh, so a construction contract award, uh, perhaps with uh, early permission by the FTA, as these are all federally funded projects, uh, to begin construction under what's called LONP, a letter of no prejudice, uh, effectively allowing us to spend that money before the full funding award. Uh, from there, the council would then continue its leadership of the project into implementation and operation. And the key federal uh, council decision at this point uh, relates to executing a full funding grant agreement with the FTA uh, that really comprises the council's commitment at that point to implement, implement, operate, and maintain the project uh, for its useful life. So a significant uh, commitment at that point to authorize the full funding grant. Uh, now, each of these steps are informed by financial information, but the level of detail within those plans develops over time. Uh, 
early in the process, capital and operating costs have been developed by local planning sponsors. The council reviews those and of course, ensures that as the, as the council's adopting the LPA, uh, that we're expected to be within uh, fiscal uh, funding expectations for the, for the long range plan. When the council's leading the project in the environmental or project development phase, we would develop those in quite a bit more detail and ultimately prepare a, a 20 year financial plan related to the project uh, that, that moves us forward in the federal process. In the engineering phase, that becomes even more detailed and really becomes a firm and final project cost estimate, uh, both for the capital and on the operating costs. So progressively more detailed information as we're moving along. When we get to the point of the full funding grant, uh, a reminder that the council is committing to implement, operate, and man maintain at that point. Uh, the, the plan typically includes the projections of how the council will fund the uh, maintenance of the project ongoing. Uh, but of note here is that the, the time horizon on that is, is relatively short compared to the lifespan of these assets. And so the, the bottom box of this slide shows one of the dynamics that we're beginning to run into as we look forward into the, into the third, fourth decade and beyond is that the full life cycle cost of these projects have not yet really been developed uh, during the planning and implementation of these guideways. And so uh, that's one of the items that uh, the council may consider further as we're, as we're advancing this because this relates directly uh, to the one of the primary capital pressures that we're that we're seeing, the level of detail in that might increase uh, over time. If we develop these plans, it might start out in a really uh, more straightforward or simple uh, manner, and then become more detailed and and refined as the project is moving toward implementation. Uh, but this is one of the primary gaps we've seen in these projects um, as they're as they've moved forward to date, and will be a major consideration moving forward. Next slide, please. So here are just a few examples of upcoming decisions uh, that may come to the council for approvals. Um, as I noted on the previous slide, the, the primary uh, approval or the primary decision that affects uh, most of these projects life is that locally preferred alternative. Each of the projects listed here has, has uh, received that approval is, is already in the regions fiscally constrained plan. These are um, progressive steps along the way toward implementation. So a rush line of approval related to uh, environmental mitigations that the council will assume in advancing the project uh, would be expected to come later this year. Uh, the Gold Lion full funding grant agreement authorization we expect to occur in, in 2022. So that uh, will be coming up as well. That's that major commitment point. Uh, there's also a uh, Rail projects underway that will have council decisions upcoming. The blue line extension is undergoing planning toward an alignment revision and uh, the Riverview uh, corridor project is advancing toward a environmental decision in, in the years ahead. So these are a few examples of the, of the steps coming up uh, before the council in uh, the months or years ahead. Next slide. Uh, finally, um, we'll talk a bit about how guideway funding works uh, before moving into the next section. So uh, there's different modes uh, shown here, as well as uh, the columns that, that relate to the development or the initial construction and the center, the net operations, how we approach the operating and, and annual kind of maintenance costs. And then the third column, uh, the capital maintenance cost, that uh, is the emerging topic. So each of these projects has had a relatively uh, common, the percentages float up and, bit, up and down a bit, but generally a, a typical share of 50% state counties or other non-federal and then 50% FTA New Starts funding. Uh, so that's pretty consistent across light rail, commuter rail, as well as dedicated guideway BRT. So these have these have evolved. The source of local funds has changed over time as county funds have increased as CTIB uh, came into being and then dissolved back into individual county contributions. Uh, but these these approaches to construction have stayed both uh, relatively reliable as well as relatively 
uh, steady in terms of federal participation common across these projects. Uh, net operations is a similar story with one exception. So generally we're looking at 50% state and 50% county funding. Uh, the state funding of this is actually uh, directed by state statute. So the state uh, by law pays 50% net operations. Uh, the, the law doesn't identify who pays the other 50%, but uh, from, from for many years, uh, essentially from the beginning, uh, that has come from the counties in one form or another. A critical exception to this uh, relates to the Green Line Extension or Southwest LRT. Uh, state law uh, says that no state funds can go towards Southwest LRT operations. So uh, that requires the assumption then that Hennepin County would be funding 100% of the net operations for Southwest LRT. For commuter rail or guideway BRT, uh, we revert to the, the standard assumption of split between 50% state and 50% counties. In the case of BRT, there's not a state statute directing that the state will pay 50%. So it's it's up in the air in terms of the, the state's appropriation for those projects, but that's the assumption that we make when we're assembling project financial plans. Uh, capital maintenance is where we begin to see some of the big differences uh, and some of the emerging directions. So we know and we'll see in subsequent slides that uh, the, the plans and the, the shortages facing light rail are uh, not likely to be funded by project related federal formula money or by uh, regional transit capital. So we're expecting shortfalls in those areas. That may be particularly pronounced with regard to Southwest LRT because no state funds may be used for capital maintenance. So it uh, requires a source to be identified. On the North Star commuter rail, most of the capital costs are actually paid as part of the operating project uh, to Burlington Northern uh, as, as part of our operating agreement. So uh, the, the capital maintenance in this regard relates primarily to fleet replacement, but the fleet has a very long life. In the emerging dedicated guideway BRT projects, uh, this is an area where we have more work to do to develop what the life cycle costs will be and what the capital maintenance plans will need to look like over the next uh, many, uh, many years. Uh, based on the current projections, we think that would be a relatively low cost to start, but then it could, it could grow significantly over time. Uh, we have work to do in terms of identifying the costs of roadway ownership, of bridge ownership uh, for, for these types of guideways, uh, and we'll be developing those over time. But from what we know right now in the long, in the long run, it's likely that the funds generated by the project's operation uh, would be, uh, it's likely they would not be sufficient to cover the capital maintenance cost. So it's an area that will uh, be continuing to develop and evolve over time. Next slide. So that concludes uh, my portion of the presentation, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions before the next section. Uh, any questions for Charles? Uh, I see uh, Council Member Chambliss. Did you have your hand up or was that from before? No, I didn't. I'll take my hand down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, so Charles, uh, when uh, we have these uh, uh, kind of uh, unfunded life cycle costs that uh, are part of the system now, uh, they have been long-term. So I think maybe the point here is that when we had the green line and the blue line. Now we're looking at a lot of new projects. The system is expanding. And as the pro as the system matures, that's where we're really are. It's within our line of sight that these costs are we're facing. And that's where this $95 million uh, opportunity from the federal funds uh, is really dedicated to the maturing elements of the blue line primarily, is that right, or uh, some of the green line? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, for the immediate projects, but also over the long term for all of these projects as they as they reach that same point of maturation, we, you know, we're planning not just for the six years ahead, but for the 60 years ahead uh, and sustaining this, this um, important system over the long term. And I guess I would observe this is not just a state of good repair. Um, this is certainly felt around the world, uh, not to 
throw aspersions to what happened in Mexico this past few weeks. But uh, if you look at some of our more mature systems around the country, Chicago, New York, Boston, even Washington, D.C., when I was living in Washington, sadly, that was in the 70s. And that was banking brand new. But now you, 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 you see kind of what systems look like when they start to kind of get that wear and tear. So if we kind of kept up with all those capital repairs, is that mean it's in systems in good shape it, it, or, or is it just doing the more immediate, uh, really kind of like subway car uh, uh, replacements? Is it, if we kept on top of capital maintenance, the system could just keep going. That true? Mr. Chair. Wes. Yeah, I'll just I'll just uh, mention that you know first of all to your first question about um, how we applied the ninety five million dollars and, and seventy five million of that went to the uh, to fulfill the unfunded capital maintenance of rail primarily that was that was uh, blue line uh, uh, because it's the older line of about I think about fifty five million dollars of the seventy five million that went to rail and and the rest went to to uh, uh, Green Line, uh, and Green Line, of course, part of that fund funding was this, the floating slab that we used to reduce vibration. And it's going to have a life cycle. But at any rate, without getting into the detail, uh, your point is correct that that what's before us really is, you know, we we de we've dealt with the immediate with 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 the good fortune of the federal relief funds, and and now we're looking out ahead for both in the most immediate. Uh, concern is green line and blue line, which you'll see later when Ed does his part of the presentation. But green line and blue line are an example of of the other lines that we have coming to us of what of what it means to be what the responsibility of maintaining these valuable assets in our region require. And and it's something that no one wants to be surprised with. It's something that is not good for the for the upkeep of the of the of the guideway to be surprised with, because funding is hard to find on the spur of the moment. It's something you have to plan for. I think this is the point you're making that you really have to plan far, far ahead to be a responsible steward of a capital asset as valuable to the region as these rail systems and as these as these dedicated BRT systems are going to be to the region. It is good stewardship. One of our one of our values and pro outcomes in in the uh, Thrive 2040 is just simply good stewardship. So, you know, I think that's the challenge that's before us. How do we get uh, a political system, typically that looks short term, <laughs> looking out, you know, 30, 40 years into the future, so that we can be responsible stewards of community assets. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Sue. Uh, this might have been covered, Charles, but I, I, I'm curious, I, as it relates to the to the policy advisory committee that I serve on with the Rush Line, I, I kind of feel like I came in well into the movie and may have missed some of the conversations that were part of it at the beginning of, of the work that the county and city officials along the proposed Rush Line have been working on but i'm curious at what point do we talk with cities and counties who are doing this planning about these long-term costs and the role they'll ha have in helping pay for them so that they're not surprised by this um I, I think that's part of what happened to us several weeks ago when folks started getting phone calls and concerns about the proposed legislation um I'm just curious as to how much of that we put out there on the table and folks understand going into this that this is going to be a long term commitment in more ways than one. Great question. Uh, I don't know, Wes Charles, do you want to? Well, I think that, that this is an issue that we're raising here. I think one of the things that Charles is pointing out is that historically, uh, there has not been that conversation about the specifics of what the what the implications are of, of the life cycle costs of these of these 
valuable assets. Uh, I know that that when in the Southwest discussion, this was when I was serving as regional administrator, there was a lot of discussion with with uh, with Hennepin County about how those funds are paid, especially when the state says we're not paying for for capital maintenance of this system. But there was no resolution of that. Uh, Southwest LRT is the perfect example of the challenge that we face, where the state has said, we're not going to pay for any of the operations, and we're not going to pay for any of the capital, long-term capital maintenance of this program. And the county has said, but that doesn't obligate the county to pay for the long-term capital maintenance of this program. And we're kind of shrugging. Uh, it reminds you of an emoji. Uh, but that's really the problem statement. And I think, you know, I wish we were giving you the solution statement here, but but the, solutions, the solution is going to be partnership. The, the solution is going to probably have to be multifaceted, as the chair mentioned. The solution is going to have to be political. And I think that, that, that that's, that's, this is, this is in, this, in this presentation, we're trying to lay out to you where decisions are made, where commitments are made, what kind of commitments we're making when, and to start thinking about how do we better identify these issues and have these conversations more upfront than when than at a point where people say, wait a minute, I wasn't expecting that and on my budget, I have plans for this funding out for 53 years, which is what we've which is what we've heard from some of our county partners. So you're right, you're right on on the question. I wish I had I wish I had a definitive answer for you. And uh, go ahead, Councilman Raventa. Well, I I just want to follow up and say I think it's it just critically important that we have um, this kind of a presentation with with the county policymakers and and key staff, and also with the current um, PACs that are working on on proposed projects, so that they aren't taken by surprise. Um, and I think sooner rather than later is is critically important. Um, there are those proposals, those projects that have op strong opposition, and this may fuel some of that, but I, I just think that, that transparency is critically important on this issue. Thank you, Councilman Vento. And I, and I would actually observe uh, that I have certainly heard about, uh, you know, uh, policymaker and certainly staff conversations uh, in the past. And I think uh, all sides maybe have assumed, well, this 50-50 in, in the example of partnership would extend to all costs. But uh, I think the legislation, as, uh, as difficult as it was, was to codify simply that arrangement. It wasn't to uh, say that there's new costs. It's just simply saying, you know, the operating uh, grants as they have been currently practiced would and, and then kind of extend that to these other costs. But if you pull back saying, you know what, we need to have this very open, eyes wide open and thoughtful conversation because as you can see, we're all in this together. So how are we yep. gonna figure this out? So I think that's kind of, that's really where we, kind of where we are now. Uh, I know Councilmember Cummings, you had a question. <laughs> Or comment. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple things. I have a question. My question is um, with the one time money that is coming, I know there are lots of restrictions on how it can be spent. I'm wondering if there is a time frame where it has to either be spent or committed. That's my question. Um, and as to the, the comments about you know codifying and having these conversations early, which is, of course, critical, I think. Um, I think we also need to uh, think about educating the public who are really the biggest stakeholders in all of these projects because they, in general, a generalization here, but in general, they have no idea. They just want it to be there, build it, and have it work. And um, then when something negative comes up, in the, especially in the mainstream press, uh, which didn't really get any kind of a correction as we had hoped, I think at least I didn't 
see that as a retraction or, re or a um, correction last week, the public is left with that information rather than a, a global understanding that if you have an asset like this, um, it, it is going to require maintenance. It is going to require ongoing costs. And, and I think you know, obviously we need to um, have these conversations with our partners, but we also need to bring in the, the traveling public and let them know as well. I think one of the things too that we are hearing is that as far as blue line and completing Southwest, the green line uh, extension and so forth is, you know, hopefully there will be uh, some infrastructure funding with this administration that might be coming our way. And um, one of the things that has been pointed out is that there is more likelihood that projects that are out there or being proposed or thought about or developed or so forth are more likely to receive funding when the partners have a plan and are successful in executing their plan. So I think we, you know, it behooves all stakeholders in these projects to be genuine partners to work out these things ahead of time so that when the next one, which, you know, the next big, big one, the blue line extension comes along, we can show that we were successfully able to negotiate the green line extension as partners and we are now ready and have a path forward on the blue line that will only work to our benefit. So um, hopefully these discussions can be ongoing and can be successful uh, going forward. So anyway, that, those are my comments, but back to my question, I'm wondering if there is a time frame that the money has to either be allocated, spent uh, or whatever. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Councilmember Cummings, I, I believe for the fr for the first two, there's not a time frame. For the last, there is. I'm going to ask Ed to give you better specifics that I can provide to you. Good afternoon, Chair. Can can you hear me? It, yes, and this might be a good segue to your uh, your uh, part of the presentation, Ed. Yes, I trust, I trust arithmetic, and I trust you. So. <laughs> Great, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, committee members, once again, Ed Petrie, Metro Transit Finance. Uh, with the CARES money, as, as Wes had mentioned, or with the federal funds, both the CARES money, which is the first federal letting, and the CRISA funds are available until expended. The, the, the ARP money, the American Rescue Plan funds, are available. They must be spent by September 30th of 2024. One of the things I do want to remind everybody, or both council members, is the fact is that when we get these grants, the money just doesn't doesn't get sent to us immediately. It's on a reimbursement basis. So when we incur the costs, we then request the grant payment. They will then reimburse us. But like I said, the first two lettings of money are available until we use it. The the ARP money is has a deadline of September 30th of 2024. I was actually on an APTA conference call about, uh, about three or four weeks ago. And one of the things that APTA was actually recommending transit agencies across the United States was to spend, once you get your, your, your CARES, CRISA, and APTA and ARP grants in place, spend your ARP money first, because that's the one that expires. And Mr. Chair, I would, I would add a, l a little bit to this that um, even though we're using these funds to push out the structural, the significant structural deficit out to 2026, we will be trying to draw these funds as quickly as possible, regardless if they say they're there till expended. It, I'd rather have them there in our in our bank than in, in someone else's bank. So we will be drawing these funds as quickly as possible, even though we will be spreading out the use of those to manage our structural deficit through through 2025. And that's one of the things that we're watching very closely. As long as, as soon as we have available expenses, we will plan to pull those those monies in. Well, why don't we see the rest of the presentation, and we'll have Jim for more questions and and conversation. Uh, Ed, are you up next? Yes, I am up next, Chair. Here you are. Okay. <laughs> Here I am. Okay, so now, uh, Chair Committee members, I will go into the existing guideways. We'll talk about the operating, some of the challenges we have with operating on, our, on the existing guideways, and then I'll talk about the capital maintenance deficits that we have all, all been discussing. First of all, as an overall framework, under the current operating agreements for our existing guideways, whether it's the Blue Line, Green Line, or North Star Commuter Rail, with the counties, we have what's called the Master Operations Funding Agreement, or the MOFA. 
This basically establishes a uniform framework for the county's contributions towards rail operations, paying the count for paying over to the council. Our current MOFA or uh, five year agreement goes through 1231, 2022. And under then under the umbrella of the MOFA then is five annual operating agreements that are specific for every transit service. So for example, Blue Line, we will have a specific operating agreement with Hennepin County on Blue Line. Green Line will have a separate agreements with Hennepin County and with Ramsey County. And with North Star, then we'd have a separate agreement with Hennepin County and Anoka County. So these annual operating agreements then set the, set up the specific terms of how the counties will then reimburse the council for costs incurred on those on those guideways. Generally, the funding parameters are set that the council or state contribution has to be at least 50%. And the counties is set at a base amount that was set in 2018 and that it, inf it inflates annually at 3.15%. So anything in excess of the base plus 3.15 then would become the state or council's responsibility. Uh, county shares, as we've detailed here, the blue line once again, it would be count would be state, and then the county share would go 100% to Hennepin County. On the green line, it's shared between state and then green line at six of the county contribution, 60% comes from Hennepin, 40% from Ramsey County. And then on North Star. You have the state contribution, but then you have the county's contribution coming in at 18.6% of that comes from Hennepin, and just over 80, approximately 81.4% comes from Anoka County. So let's move to the next slide. So this will give you a, somewhat of a summary of the challenges we have right now with our current operating grant agreements. Uh, we had executed 2020 grant agreements with Anoka, Hennepin, and Ramsey County. Uh, both Anoka, excuse me, both Ramsey and Hennepin County have paid their 2020 grant agreements. They're broken into four quarterly installments. Those two counties have paid. Uh, Anoka County has discontinued payment under their 2020 grant agreement. Uh, so they have not paid us for both third quarter and fourth quarter of 2020. And that amounts to just under $2.5 million. Uh, moving into 2021, uh, no counties have approved or paid for their standard, standard annual operating grant agreements. Uh, taking you a little back in time, the council, we prepared the, the application for the grant agreements. We submitted them to all the three counties back in November, uh, answered respective country questions, made modifications to the grant agreements as agreed upon with the counties, and then formally submitted the grant applications on uh, January 8th of 2021. To date, uh, Hennepin County has, uh, it has come to their board twice. It came to their board on April 3rd, excuse me, on April 20th and on May 4th. Uh, both times Hennepin County tabled the grant agreements for Blue, Green, and North Star and have now pushed it on to the next board meeting on May 18th. Uh, Ramsey County uh, was it was presented to their board on August or excuse me April 27th. Uh, they also tabled the grant agreement for the, the Green Line operations and have pushed that forward to a future board meeting that has not been uh, designated. And there have been no uh, meetings set up with Anoka County at all. Uh, so right now, as of May 15th of 2021. Like I said, we have we have the, the installments are broken out into four quarterly installments, payable February 15th, May 15th, August 15th, and then October 15th. So based upon those periods, as of May 15th, we will have unpaid rail operations from the counties of nearly $18 million in arrears. Uh, we're watching, uh, working with our controller, we're watching our cash flows very, very closely. Uh, right now, as of this point in time, we anticipate the light rail funds, the blue and green lines will go into a negative cash position sometime within the next week. And then we have been watching commuter rail operations. They should go into a negative cash balance sometime this fall 
around the September timeline of 2021. But our maiden concern is on light rail operations. As of this point, they will be going negative within the next week. Next slide. Now the next piece is the capital maintenance. As we've all been talking about the capital maintenance after the line gets up and going, we have to do things to maintain the asset in a state of good repair so that asset can keep moving on and maintaining safety and being able to produce service. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've done a lot of work on uh, capital forecasting and capital maintenance forecasting. We went out 30 years to year 2051 to do our capital maintenance forecasting. Uh, within all of our forecasts, we assumed that the council could pretty well balance ourselves on the rail side to years 21 through approximately 2026, mainly with the use of the federal formula funds and the matching uh, RTC dollars. But then we then start identifying then what our challenges were from, from 2027 through 2051. In our analysis, we did some forecasting of the federal 5307 formula funds. Uh, each year, every transit agency across the United States has to file what's called a, an NTD cost report with the federal government, where we, where we will report the number of hours of service, number of miles of service, fixed gate guideway hours and miles, passengers, our costs, revenues, et cetera. Based upon that, the, the federal government then allocates across the nation 5307 formula funds that you could then use for your capital needs of your, of your uh, systems. Uh, we also then also forecasted 5337 fixed guideway funds that we will then also receive. The 5307 formula funds you generally start receiving two years after the inception of operations. And the fixed guideway money will start approximately seven years after you start operations. So we forecasted all these formula dollars and forecasted with the matching regional transit capital. If you recall, the council gets bonding authority from the legislature that we then issue bonds called regional transit capital bonds, which we then use to match our federal dollars. Because to be able to utilize the federal dollars that we receive from the federal government, they're usually set up with an 80-20 split. So you can do a, you can apply for a grant, 80% of the money can be federal, but you have to have a 20% local match. And we have generally used regional transit capital dollars as that over as that local match. Uh, some of the guide, the capital maintenance items that we're looking at over the next through year 2051 include, as we talked about, like the vehicle overhauls, there's some vehicle replacements, you know, track replacement, building station main, uh, maintenance, technology, fair collection systems, all these tips, types of items to maintain the system in a state of good repair. Uh, two of the uh, systems I do want to highlight here is both the green line capital maintenance, which is the existing green line, and the blue line, which is the existing blue line capital maintenance deficits. For the period of 27, 2027 through 2051, green line has a cap forecast of capital maintenance deficit of about $269 million. So we broke it down into 10 year increments, looking at years uh, 2031 cum cumulative, 2041 cumulative and 2051. So after about 10 years, Green Line will have a deficit of about $18 million. That will then cum cumulative will grow to about 223 as of year 2041. And then out at year 2051, it grows to about $269 million. Uh, we did the same analysis on the blue line capital. Uh, they have a forecasted deficit of about uh, $431 million through 2051. After the first 10 years, it's at about 23 million. The 20 year mark, it's gonna be at about 293 and at 30, 30 years out at 20, 2051, it does grow to about $431 million. Uh, one of the things that Charles did mention earlier is our North Star capital maintenance. Most of our capital maintenance needs are part of the BNSF contract that we currently pay for with an annual basis on our operating side. But one of the things that be, that, this, that would not be included would be the future vehicle repairs, local motor repairs, and any types of repairs that we have at our respective stations. So the next slide. So with that chair, I have gone through the existing guideways, both operating and capital. And before Nick goes on to the next slide, I would stand for any questions. Thanks, Ed.
Any questions? Oh, uh, Aretha, I see you. Yeah, I just wanted um, it to be on the record that um, our counties have been aware of uh, our request for payments for quite some time. Um, this is just not a last minute ask. Um, can you can you speak more specifically to that? Uh, yes, the chair and committee members. Yes, the committee, the council members, or excuse me, the counties are aware because, like I stated, we do bill them every quarter. So, for example, like Anoka County, for example, we billed them back in August. We billed them again in November. Uh, we sent them a reminder bill the end of December. I also then, as a director of finance, also sent a, a, an, an email to the deputy administrator at Anoka County, reminding them that we're going to be re reflecting the amounts that they owed for 2020 as a receivable on our records. We get audited by the state of Minnesota. They also get audited by the state of Minnesota. So I wanted to ensure, just to remind them, they needed to show that as an accounts payable on their records to the council, or there would have been an audit finding. Uh, we've also then uh, we do we do so we've done all the billings starting in 2021 since we have no signed agreement i cannot bill them but they are very aware they're very full aware of it because we're under like I, like i said earlier we're under a five-year master operating funding agreement which would then be set up with five annual operating agreements on an annualized basis we submitted our draft grant application in november they reviewed it, we answered questions, and then we then formally submitted the formal application on January 8th. And like I mentioned, two of the counties, both Anoka and Ramsey counties, have allowed Wes and I to do the presentation to their boards for the 2021 grant agreements. They tabled it for a future meeting, but we have heard no response from Anoka County. uh judy you had a question thank you mr chair just two quick ones on that point uh and why do we have um we have so we have a five-year overall operating agreement and then we execute that by one year agreements that have to be um perfected i guess would be the word i don't understand that these are long-term capital commitments I cannot understand why we don't have a long term agreement that is very hard to undo because it brings everybody to the table very seriously at the beginning. And to get out of it, you better have a really good reason by all parties agreeing to some level of supermajority or majority or however it would work. You know, since we are obligated to collect the funds, it really puts us at a huge disadvantage, obviously, because um, we're finding ourselves in this position. So, one, I am blown away and cannot believe that you know and it's not a judgment it's not you know i'm just blown away though that that that's how we put together the agreement on major major funding commitments that we're on the hook for and i do appreciate our partners but imagine if anything comes up where their funding is is somehow put in jeopardy for whatever they're responsible for I mean, it's just like at home during this crisis, during this pandemic, people have so much money coming into their homes, probably less than before the pandemic for some, unfortunately, and they only have so much money to spend. So they have to decide which is the highest priority and then down the list. So I don't, I don't understand that. And so, so, so whatever we do in the future for, for the things that are on the books now, for the things that are coming up to be booked and for the things that are further out there to build the whole system, um, I just hope I, I can't support anything but much, much longer term commitments for the life of an asset um, to to be a good steward in all of this. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you was on those guideway um, uh, projections. Again, that is everything we have currently now. That does not uh, show anything that might be off into the future that we have not um, approved yet. Is that correct? Uh, Chair committee members, yes, that you are totally correct. This was looking at the current operations for Blue Line, Green Line. We looked at North Star. Uh, we also uh, then looked at some of the future lines, for example, like Gold Line. But any of the other ones that are out there that will be coming, we have not done that forecasting and forecast yet. 
Thank you. So, and and I I uh, assumed that. Um, and just for for the rest on the council, I mean, I've kind of stumbled across this and found out about this and been digging on this being part of the transit policy work group, um, asking questions. Um, and I I am you know if if I was some sort of a, an alert machine, all of the red flags and bells would be going off right now. I mean, I'm that concerned about where we're going right now. I don't know how how we proceed without doing a big time out and getting all the stakeholders together and going, you know what, this is serious and we cannot responsibly look at future commitments and planning, whether they're initiated at the local level, which a lot of these are, or they're initiated on our end because we don't initiate all of these, right? So um, we've got a patchwork of how we've cobbled this together, which, you know what, given the current funding scenario over the past 15, 20 years that I've watched transportation funding, um, holding my breath most years, just so that we don't have bridges collapse anymore, right? And we can just service people to their basic needs, right? Um, I don't have a lot of faith in that system. And even at the federal level with the Biden administration and feeling much more secure, you know, it's again, a four year cycle. So I'm just saying as one council member, I greatly appreciate the opportunity for us as a whole council to dig into this. I agree with the statements that have been made that this needs to be elevated. So the policymakers know, the legislature knows, our congressional delegation knows, and as importantly, the public knows um, because they get bits and pieces, they're busy people, and nobody really knows this is going on, but it's going to happen on our watch. And what we do is going to set the pace and set the security, if if we can, on how we build out a system that, that has... Um, greater greater security for continued payment in the future. I just don't know how I can support um, the system as it is. I mean, we have to pay the bills for what we have, but when we keep talking about bringing on new lines and bringing on new lines, I mean, I'm for that, don't get me wrong, but to be fiscal steward of the taxpayers across this region, we can't continue to do it without knowing we've got certainty around those payments, absolutely can't. And I, I plan to, you know, as, for my district, you know, I've got um, suburban providers, you know, but I think regionally, right? So I'm I'm gonna really lean into this. I'm not on the transportation committee, but I think this is one of, you know, we have racism we gotta solve for, we've got a pandemic at our hands, but I think this is right up there with one of the biggest problems and challenges we, this council is gonna need to solve for. And we're gonna have to be courageous because we can't, we can't just keep passing the buck with our other partners. And I love our other partners, but we all have to step up. And I think this deserves some strong attention, some sort of a collective summit on this. Um, otherwise, I don't know how I can ever support, you know, future planning for more. Councilmember Johnson, thank you for your comments. And I just want to put a spotlight on one element that you said, which is what you implied, which is if we had actually kind of had eyes open and codified this 10 years ago, it'd be a whole lot easier. <laughs> and But our moment is now, and it, and we're trustees, we're fiduciaries for the system and for the future. So I think uh, that is the sentiment to which we need to open it up and look at the whole picture. Council member Chambliss, you got a hand. Yeah, um, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with council member uh, Johnson. And, um, you know, one thing that, uh, struck me about what she said. It, it's not just about being um, good stewards. It's about looking to the future and investing in our infrastructure. Um, transit oriented development is the way that we have been able to get our communities to thrive. It's the way that we inject uh, fuel into our economy. So it's about more than just paying the bills. It's about um, responsibility for um, being stewards of creating and planning for and supporting a thriving economy in the state of Minnesota. Great comments. Any other uh, quick thoughts? I don't know if Nick, you had a wrap up or maybe Deb, but uh, you probably had a, we're kind of done with the presentation or did you have that last uh, slide? One quick wrap up. I don't know if Council Member Barber had a question before that. Or... Yeah, go ahead, Deb. Why don't you uh, hear your? Sure. Um, thank you, Councilmember Johnson and Councilmember Chambliss. I think you captured really 
um, uh, where we wanted to go with some of this conversation so we can start thinking really um, um, uh, very focused on the future, but still knowing that we want to build the system and how are we going to do it? And how are we going to do it well? So um, just wanted to um, ask one quick question. Um, so as it was mentioned, we're moving into um, a, a rail oper operations, moving into a negative cash position starting next week. So what are the next steps? How do we how do we account for that at council? Uh, Chair, committee members, uh, this is that again. Uh, per council policy, per the cash flow manager council policy is we have the ability to go negative up to $10 million, not to exceed okay. 90 days. Uh, but what our process would be then, our plan would be then to come to the management committee and the council with a business item and a cash flow forecast for the rail lines, for both the light rail and the commuter rail to inform you, you know, what point we're going to go, we will have gone negative and then where we think we're going to be hitting that $10 million mark. Now I see Mary's on, on the line also. Did you want to add anything, Mary? No, Ed, I think you, you caught it well. So we will be coming to the management committee and then the council with with the cash flow plan. How's the mover vento? Um, do, do we have any sense of getting some some direct communication from the counties as to what you know what to expect? Um, is this a temporary sort of a slap in our hands, or is this going to be a long term fight? Do do we have any way of knowing that? Um, I can give you, I have certainly, not just me, we've had conversations with policymakers and there's certainly been more conversations staff to staff. And um, uh, I would say there's two fundamental issues. One is the long term, which is really kind of important. I mean, this is like, how was we as a region going to uh, account for um, uh, or plan for uh, the, uh, maintaining and building and maintaining these systems. Uh, the other is the short term of kind of the operating agreements, which which are under kind of existing protocols. And I think, you know, I I I, I think what we've told is they want to take a pause, maybe to sort out the larger issues. And they seem to be a great deal of concern because the um, legislation which codified this practice, which uh, has been characterized as, as an attack to the counties, and it was rolled out in a funky way to which I have apologized on numerous occasions, but it's it's still there. And the uh, governor and the councils, we pulled back that, um, that proposal, but it still is in the Senate bill. So I think the fact that it's in the Senate bill, it's in the conference committee, I do know the House uh, leadership will be very adamantly opposed, I think as the governor would oppose that legislation. But what I've said in testimony is, this is a real issue. We don't need legislation to force us to, to figure it out. We're in conversations with the county. So we have to continue those conversations and that kind of planning uh, as to what this will look like uh, going at now and going forward. So. Um, now, had those formal conversations, there's some staff to staff, and I think we're now in a phase to be really candid of kind of a lot of positioning and flexing. There's, I can't say there's been a lot of productive, like, let's just lay down our spears and shovels and how we're going to figure this out, which is what I think we need to do. All right, if we could just maybe just go to that last slide, I think we've uh, captured a lot of it. Um, but I, I'd ask you also to put on your MPO hat as the council too, that we've talked about long-term transit capital needs here today and operating, but this is not unique to transit. Uh, it's the transportation infrastructure has similar issues. You know, 15 years ago, our state had no way to replace the major bridges in the state financially. Um, so, and they solved that, solved that challenge and I, I think there's some options to solve it here. What we presented tonight is really pointing out that a lot of these things are, are rely, we're relying on others to solve it. So it's, it's as the chair had mentioned, it's a discussion and we all, the region and the state needs to be the solution. It's, it's gonna be multiple aspects to that. We still need to grow our system. Our, our population is growing, our economies are growing. This Metro network vision for the region um, is still valid. 
we know that all day reliable transportation service that connects the everybody to this region is important and still is, but it has this major unstable funding that we need that we've talked about tonight. And we need a solution. You know, it's we need a solution in the very short term, uh, as Ed just mentioned for our cash flow, but we need as we continue to build this, we need to build it and also get a solution to this long term so that we maintain a system that meets the public's need in a good state of repair for decades as our region grows. So we just wanted to summarize that, but we've had that discussion throughout the night. That concludes our formal slides, Chair, and Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks everybody for participating in this. I think we've said a number of things, one of which, of course, is have our eyes open, that, that there's pressure points, that there does need to be a longer term transportation funding solution. It is undercapitalized on the road and bridge side as well as this transit. Uh, but uh, to know that we have some near term, you know, pinch points, we have partners. And and I think I will echo what I've heard from a number of you. We love our partners. We work with them all the time. We have a mutual interest in this stable transit system. But, uh, let, but we also have to have our eyes open and consider uh, you know what our important role is in convening and determining how that is going to move forward. So um, we've had a number of questions. I know Molly, you had your hand up first, then Judy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, oh, oh, I'm not unmuted. Okay, I'm I'm wondering. I know that transit systems across the country are in dire shape, much like we are, and uh, I know that relative to many of those, we are actually in much healthier shape. I'm wondering if how these issues have been addressed by other uh, transit systems around the country. Were they successful, even though they may be struggling now? Is there something that we can look at or learn from or use as an example of successful sharing of, of these costs as we move forward? Wes? No. Yeah, I, Mr. Chair and, and Councilmember Cummings, I don't know that I have a, a ready answer to your question. I think uh, it's a, it's a good question. I think other transit systems, as I read, have been struggling with 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 the answer to this. I don't. I know that uh, that there has been uh, a significant funding discussions in the areas that 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 Charlie had mentioned in Boston and Chicago, and I don't know that they've come to an ultimate solution. But I do know you do know when you visit there that they have a significantly aging system. And it, and it's a it's a system that that is representative of what we're trying to avoid in terms of of, of not waiting too long for that and and I, I I'm not I'm not aware of a ready-made solution that is that is uh, transferable to to our our region I think every region has this unique funding structure. That's it. Uh, Molly, as a follow-up. Just as a follow up, it's, it's interesting to me that the federal government, who is funding 50% or so of the costs of these systems, hasn't required these agreements for maintenance of the asset in the long term, that they just say, well, here's your money, you guys figure it out. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, these are huge dollars and systems of key importance to every thriving metropolitan area, but to the country as a whole. And for the federal government, they have so many guidelines and so many restrictions and things that you have to do that to just throw it out there and say, well, here's the money, good luck, is amazing to me. But apparently that, it sounds like historically that is the way that it has been. Is that correct? Because it sounds like nobody's worked this out and it's all sort of flying by the seat of your pants. Is that, am I right on that? And if you look at some of the deferred maintenance under capitalization of uh, uh, pick on Boston, I mean, God love it, but uh, they need to do some significant kind of rebuilding and, and uh, San Francisco is facing that. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. West, Chair, I, that. in response yeah. to, uh, to, to council member Cummings, uh, it's not a way to run a business. That's, that's for sure. The chair knows more about that than, 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 uh, I certainly do, but when it's you, think, you know, but, um, um, when when you look at at um, Charles's charts about process, I think there are opportunities for us 
to raise these issues in a more meaningful way than what we've done and 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 uh, and build structures into a pro into a process that we need to think about how we can build structures into a process that requires uh, that requires the the wrestling with these issues early on and the answers to these issues being arrived at more early on. Um, you know, if you think about the council's responsibilities, one of them, the, the, the primary charge of the council is the economical development of the region and, and stewardship is, is there in that statement. And so I, I not only think it's a good idea, I think it's a required idea of, of us to, to, to look at, at the development of these, of these guideways with a life cycle in mind, not just, not just the ribbon cutting in mind. Mm -hmm. Mary, did you you wanted to add something? Mr. Chair, I think we caught most of it. I, I I think we're at an opportunity right now because we are a younger system than we see across the nation. And and so, you know, coming in and battling this right now, even though it's hard, and even though we have to make some really hard decisions about the, the systems that are coming before us, the new systems, uh, I, this is the perfect opportunity for, for us to be battling this issue now while we're young enough to do, young enough in our system to do something about the future. So um, it's apples and oranges it's in terms of how each of our systems are funded across the nation. Um, I don't think there's any quite like ours where we have a multitude of funding sources, um, but now is the time and now is the opportunity for us to, to fix this. And why didn't we do it 10 years ago? Part of that is just political will. The, the will was to build um, and that pushed us past, past this. Even though we were having those conversation, there just wasn't a will to solve it. I think we have to have that now. Judy. Not for tonight, but I would just like to know how any of this might impact the suburban transit providers. I mean, they are linking into the overall system. So to presume that it's just us, right? It's it's broader. So I mean, that's just a question that we can dig into. I can ask staff later, but you know, just a nod to our suburban transit providers. We recognize them as really wonderful partners in all of this too. And and our clients are traveling within jurisdictions jurisdictions it's just like a plow truck they don't care what color or what logo is on the truck they just want their streets plowed and i think it's the same with transit right so um it's just a nod tonight in our discussion that we care about our suburban providers because i have two in my district and just wanted i'll i'll follow up maybe with nick and wes later on that thank you and really important because this is a whole network and uh suburban providers are part of that although you know they participate in our grant funds and our operating. I mean, it, it's not operating funds through MVEST. Um, they're not quite that the big dollars because they're a smaller part of the overall puzzle. But when you think about our arterial bus rapid transit, I mean, we have a Transit X, which is a very visionary program, not quite the billions of dollars. So we've got some uh, state uh, bonding funds for, for those operations. They're in a sense replacing and enhancing existing service, but it, but it ultimately we want to ensure that we don't sacrifice developing those because we have liabilities somewhere else. So that's the other kind of equation. We want to make sure we're not losing sight of our vision uh, that is in collaboration with so many, but let's not lose our momentum. Um, let's see, Sue. Um, I since we're getting close to the end and this isn't directly related to our conversation per se but it does have to do with transit and i just want to do a shout out um i had a conversation earlier this afternoon with the city administrator for landfall a community of about 750 manufactured housing located in the corner of woodbury oakdale uh, maplewood just off of century in 94. And he shared with me that yesterday met transit along with blue cross blue shield and guardian angels church and perhaps some others provided a vaccine clinic and 60 people were vac vaccinated yesterday. Um, they're coming back next week to do additional vaccines and then in a few weeks they'll do the second round and I just want to say thanks. This is a community that. Um, is a, a lot of people drive by it not even realizing that it is a community and they just figure it's either part of oakdale or woodbury or maplewood they have a significant number of people who are multilingual and they have been hit um 
pretty significantly in the last year by COVID and the economic impact. So thank you. Um, on behalf of Landfill, thank you very much. This is great advertising. I, and thank good. you for mentioning Thank you for mentioning that. I went to our kind of launch of our six buses in collaboration with the Department of Health and Blue Cross Blue Shield and a lot of local sponsors around the state. But I tell you what, talking to the maintenance folks and the drivers and those people in our shop, they were so proud of the work they did so efficiently. We converting, you know, I'm a bus guy. You convert a bus into a clinic, it's awesome. I mean, and and you know, they could they have the capacity of doing 120 vaccinations a day in each bus. You know, you think about those hard to reach places and how we need to get to 70%. We'll do it because of that kind of innovation. And really great that we were able to be part of it. So I agree. Kudos to Matt Transit for getting that done. Molly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a comment on Mary's comment that, you know, 10 years ago, uh, the political will was such to move this forward and, and pedal to the metal on without maybe thinking and codifying, obviously, the, the maintenance costs. But what that makes me want to reiterate is, again, our responsibility to educate the public, because it is the public who elect the politicians who say this is okay, this isn't okay, we need to change it, we need to plan differently. So again, I hope that we can uh, do our part of educating and and encouraging the public will to say, you know what, we need to look at this differently so that we don't have a system that ages like Boston, like DC, like the ones that are really crumbling. We need to preserve the asset. And, and I think a lot of that uh, assistance can come from the public who are using this. So I just want to throw that out once again. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Francisco. Sorry, this was a, a very eye-opening and sobering presentation as far as the, the structural financial issues that are medium and long range going to affect everything that the, we do on transit and transportation. Um, I, I think that the next step, of course, is to try to come up with some answers or solutions. And I hope that when we do that, we, we are, um, we go big and also leave no um, outcome or, or possible solution uh, without at least uh, being discussed. And I'm just gonna say this, if, if there's no commitment from the, the users and the public and the private sector for transit, then that has to be an option that we have to say, right, you don't wanna fund this thing? Let's let's dismantle it or let's parcel it out. I think that having that stark and 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 blunt part of all of this should be part of the conversation. Um, and also bringing in the private sector because many times we talk about oh the 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 underserved communities that use the the transit system that we need to hear about them. Um, we need to hear about the, the suburban folks, but the, the whole point of doing transportation and transit is to move people around to further the economy of the region. And that's mostly the private sector. Again, if 3M and the other large corporations feel that they have no vested interest in transportation, then they should state so. Um, and but at least they should be part of the conversation and and uh, make make all the stakeholders, private and public, be uh, owners of the ultimate resolution. Be either a rescue of the system or just let it fall apart. That was my happy thought uh, for for tonight. Any Mr. Chair, thoughts? yes. Um, following on the happy thoughts, um, we haven't really talked about the, the, uh, drop off in ridership and how, I mean, 
there's been little bits of talk. I'm not on the transportation committee that that ridership will come back in a few years, but what if it doesn't? And at what point do we start evaluating the the new lines that haven't been built yet, based on uh, the the new normal, whatever that ends up being for transit ridership? You know, it's interesting. Uh, thank you, Wendy. That there is uh, going to be an article appearing soon about the future of transit, and one of the things, uh, you know, is that uh, the hardest hit. Uh, parts of our system have been these longer uh, express routes, and you know we'll be people will be commuting those longer express routes quite the same way. Maybe maybe not. Maybe we won't have quite the same rush hours. But our best performing has been these ABRTs, which are frequent service enhanced in all day long. So transit might shift quite a bit, and I think that. We certainly would want to be responsive in this system to consider, you know, how these trends are in the future. We we, we kind of believe that there is a, going to be a really critical role for transit going forward, both for uh, economic reasons, for environmental reasons, and these investments in our infrastructure in cities and in these hubs will likely continue, but. In, in which way, and we certainly think about access, economic access, the equity investments that we know are important for our future are, are, are really tied into uh, to some of these uh, new lines. Uh, Riva. Yeah, I, I don't wanna belabor the issue, but I think that was a good question uh, by council member Wolf. Um, yeah. we, we do know that in the areas, areas where we have light rail, there is trend, high transit dependency and high usage compared to maybe where we have some of the ex express lines or some uh, like where North Star was. So um, we don't for, we don't want to forget about that um, and that um, we fully expect to have um, good usage on our uh, local and city buses. And we might have to look at um, other ways that people are traveling and living and doing their work and also giving this a little bit of time. Um, change is going to take time. Uh, we don't know how things are going to rebound. Um, so we don't want to overreact uh, either. And, you know, I would underscore that this is what Mary said. This is an opportunity because we're a relatively developing system. Uh, we're in good shape. We, we aren't you know, the, the CARES Act funding isn't just keeping us alive for a few months, it's keeping us alive for a few years to kind of have this transition. And uh, I think uh, we need to be thinking about how to, the benefits of transit, which is I think what Councilmember Chambliss was saying, is just not lose sight of the fact that there's huge returns for our for our region with, with, with these investments. We just got to get it right so we can sustain it. Any kind of last thoughts? The, the Transportation Committee Chair, Deb, Barbie, you've got the one of the last words here. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll do a quick uh, uh, summary to um, Wendy and Riva's question. I think um, a lot of the studies that we're working on, like we did the, we're doing the second half of Network Next, we're going to have a chance to factor in some of these things, both, both what is going to change and uh, our are not only modes that people are using are going to change or the times of day and things like that. So we'll we'll have some more information coming out over that um, over the next year or two. So um, I think that's really important as we kind of look how we build back the system. Um, so um, one thing I just want to say um, to uh, actually to thank you, Chair, and thank all of you council members. Um, I mean, these are tough discussions that we're having, and I'm really happy that we were able to have this conversation today. Um, I think that um, this is a great time to sit and really look at this, um, these financial issues very critically going forward and really appreciate um, getting the topic out there and the good conversation around it. Well, we're kind of closing on time, but uh, I will just echo that thought. This is a great conversation. It was really needed. Uh, I know that some of us wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. Now there'll be, you know, 17 of us waking up in the middle of the night thinking about it. But uh, I actually do think, uh, frankly, when there's a kind of an aligned will, we're gonna we're gonna be able to figure this out. But we're gonna figure this out by 
by making it uh, more transparent and 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 having regular updates and I'm working with our partners. So um, with that thought, uh, I know we're going to talk about this again, but I think this is a great kind of level setting of about these issues that you certainly will read about, hear about. Uh, but if you have ever any questions, and you'll be asked, uh, feel free to uh, both speak, but also to ask. Uh, I know Mary, myself, Deb, Wes, Charles, Ed, you know, and Nick, we're all kind of steeped in this, and uh, and it is evolving. So we certainly appreciate your help as uh, regional ambassadors to help, uh, uh, you know, the conversation that we're all going to be having. With that, I think uh, uh, unless there's anything else, uh, that nice weather that Deb's going to send our our way, we'll be here tomorrow. So uh, hopefully we'll uh, all see you soon, and I look forward to uh, to the next chapter on all this, all these these issues. This this meeting's adjourned. Thanks, Bye. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.